So we're all ready to go then. Well, okay. I see participants just coming online. So we'll give everyone a few minutes, I think. I'm sorry, how are you seeing them, Ann Barbara? <laughs> There's a participants bubble at the bottom. Oh, there. Okay. All right. Got it. Yep. Welcome, everyone. We'll just give everyone a few minutes to join. Welcome everyone, we'll just start in uh, one minute, I think. Welcome everyone. It's my very great pleasure to welcome you here today for a noon talk. Uh, my name is Ann Barbara Graff. I'm the provost at NASCAD. Uh, I think uh, what we will start with is a territorial acknowledgement and then I'd like to thank uh, the Accessibility Committee and then I will pass you on to Professor Jane Wark to introduce our speaker today. So Nazcat is in Mi'kmaq on the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq Nation. This, treaty, this territory is covered by the Treaties of Peace and Friendship, which Mi'kmaq and Elastiquic peoples first signed with the British Crown in 1725. The treaties did not deal with the surrender of lands and resources, but instead established the rules for what was to be an ongoing relationship between nations, and we are very grateful for that welcome. Today I'm pleased uh, to be able to, uh, uh, to, to welcome you to a talk originated by the Accessibility Committee of NASCAD. The Accessibility Committee was convened uh, first during COVID uh, and has undertaken two significant um, actions over the past year. Uh, one is to establish an accessibility working group and they are working very hard on an accessibility working plan. Uh, we have been working with Reachability uh, on helping us to develop that plan. Uh, and the second thing we've achieved is being able to invite our first speaker to campus because what we really want is a conversation about accessibility um, and producing a culture not only of accommodation, but of welcome and of accessibility. So with that, I'd like to pass you over to Jane Wark to introduce our speaker today. Thank you, um, Dr. Graf. Uh, yes, my name is Jane Wark, and I'm on the Accessibility Advisory Committee. I'm also a faculty member uh, in the Art History and Contemporary Culture uh, Division at NASCAD. And I am um, uh, very pleased to be able to ho host this uh, talk this morning with our guest speaker, Dr. Eliza Chandler. Before I begin with the introduction to Dr. Chandler, however, I'd like to let those of you uh, who are here today who uh, let you know that we have ASL interpretation for this event. And in order to access that, if you go to the chat, you will see a link there for the ASL interpretation. It's in a separate Zoom meeting. And through that link, you will be able to both uh, hear Dr. Chandler uh, watch the, um, her presentation and also um, uh, access the ASL interpretation. And if you have any technical support questions around interpretation uh, or anything else in that session, you can just email, um, multi e email the multimedia um, person, which is Will Robinson. But uh, the email, or sorry, not email, um, you can send a chat, a message in the chat, 
um, to Will uh, through the multimedia name. I hope that's clear. Um, so yes, uh, this morning or now it's noon uh, here in um, uh, Kijiptik, Halifax, uh, we are having this presentation by Dr. Liza Chandler. The title of Dr. Chandler's presentation is Critical Inclusions, Disability Arts Practices Towards Cultural Transformation. Dr. Chandler graduated with her BFA from NASCAD in 2005 and then received her BA in Art History from NASCAD in 2007. She received an MA from York University in Critical Disability Studies in 2008, and a second MA in Equity Studies in Education from the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education. That was in 2009. Dr. Chandler then earned her PhD in Social Justice and Education from the University of Toronto in 2014. Dr. Chandler is currently Assistant Professor in the School of Disability Studies at Ryerson University in Toronto, where she leads a research program that centers on disability arts. This research interest came into focus when from 2014 to 2016, she was the Artistic Director of Tangled Art and Disability, an organization in Toronto dedicated to showcasing disability arts and advancing accessible curatorial practice. Dr. Chandler teaches and researches in the areas of disability arts, critical access studies, social movements, and crip necro politics. Perhaps Dr. Chandler will explain that term to us during her talk. Dr. Chandler has received many awards and honors she is a member of the Royal Society of Canada's College of New Scholars. She participates in a number of research grants, including co-directing the Shirk funded partnership project called Bodies in Translation, Activist Art, Technology and Access to Light. She is also leading the Shirk funded Insight Development Project called Accessing the Arts, Centering Disability Perspectives in Accessibility Initiatives. Dr. Chandler's talk will be about 45 minutes, which will leave us time for discussion afterwards before we wrap up at 1.30. The discussion period will consist of comments that you can put in the chat. And then I, because we're in a webinar format, we will have to do it that way. And I'll read your questions out for Dr. Chandler for her to answer them. Uh, and because we're in a webinar format, we won't be able to hear you all, but please join me um, in a warm welcome to Dr. Chandler. Thank you very much. Hi there, thanks so much, Jane, for the warm introduction. Um, thanks to um, Anne Barbara Gaff for your introduction, um, and thanks to um, the BVA for supporting this talk. Um, Thanks also to, lots of thanks this morning. Thanks to Bill Robinson for your tech support. Um, and I'd also like to, as um, Jane did, acknowledge and thank Ioka Janaid for her interpreting work. And thank you all for coming. So as Jane explained, um, I'll be talking for about 45 minutes and, and then we'll have time for discussion. But if at any time you have comment or questions, you can enter them into the, the Q&A section of the Zoom. So, um, Will, would you mind sharing the slides at this point? Thank you. So this slide just um, has the title of my talk, but you can click to the next slide. Thanks. So as, as sort of it's, it's stated on this slide, um, we'll, we'll sort of work through a few different topics today. And so um, I'll begin by introducing disability art. And as I do that, I'll position it as a political project. Um, I'll give examples of disability art and that work to change representations of disability. Um, from nothing more than a, than a problem in 
in need of solution into something that is dynamic, intersectional, diverse, politically engaged, um, something that is a, an identity in a community. So, so I'll, I'll demonstrate how disability art can participate in, in changing how disability is represented and subsequently understood. Um, and it's, it's in that sort of um, action of changing representation that I locate disability art as, as political. And I'm sure a lot of you um, take up artwork in, in a similar manner in respect to your own practice. So from here, um, we'll, we'll sort of change directions a little bit and I'll introduce um, what, I, what I call crypt cultural practices, which are innovative ways of making, creating and experiencing art that are rooted in disability culture. And it's in this discussion that I'll introduce um, this idea that Jane spoke about in her introduction um, of critical access practices which refer to access practices that are generated by disabled people and work to center not only disabled people, but also our politics. So we'll talk about how these acts of critical access um, aren't necessarily oriented towards inclusion. This is where we get critical about inclusion, but, but they, they can actually um, when we when we take up access as a political practice, we can think about how it um, can work in anti assimilationist ways towards transforming culture, rather than simply including people into a culture which might not work for many of us for many reasons. So that's that's what we'll do, and it's it's a bit funny not to be able to see or see you, but I trust that we're on the same page. So let's begin with just a couple um, sort of framing definitions of disability art. So you can click forward to the next slide, please. So as, as we'll sort of take up through this talk, um, there are many ways of framing disability art and they're all contentious. Um, even, even the sort of basic definition, the disability art is made by disabled people comes into contention when you think about how the word disability and the meaning of disability as being something other than a normative body um, is really mobilizes colonial logic. And, and so the word disability may not make sense um, as an identification category in other cultures, particularly indigenous cultures. So to say disability art is made up of people who practice art and identify as disabled risks reinscribing colonial narratives on who we, we um, identify as being part of us and who is not. So, so it's complicated as everything is um, in this talk and needs to be approached critically. However, I think it's important to have some um, common understandings about what we're talking about when we're talking about disability art. So I'm just gonna read out these three framing definitions that are on the screen that I think um, help us understand disability art as a politically engaged pr practice. So the first, um, the first quote is, it comes from a report done on disability art published in 2001, um, and, and Abbas and her co-writers, um, they write, disability arts and culture marks the growing political power of disabled people over their narratives as, um, as disabled artists use it to counter cultural misrepresentations, establish their disability as a valued human condition shift control to disabled people so they might shape their narrative and bring this disability controlled narrative to a, a wider audience. Kirsty Johnston writes, disability art is a challenge to um, an undermining of, at a minimum, traditional aesthetics and social value. 
And finally, Catherine, for thee, who lives right now and um, at of Canning, Nova Scotia, in Baxter's Harbor, she writes, not all of disability art is exclusively about the disability experience, but all of it, I would suggest, springs from disability experience. And to be fully appreciated, must be seen and heard with all of its historic and biographical resonances. Um, so those are just a, a few framing concepts, ways of conceptualizing dis disability arts. So if you, you can go to the next slide, please. To the next slide. Um, so, so now we're going to sort of think with this radical transformation um, possibility that I think disability arts can engender. So this this is some work by disability artist Jess Sash um, in, in collaboration with Holly Norris in 2011. Just created this series called American Evil. Um, for people like myself, um, the, the aesthetics in this work are quite familiar. They resemble um, American apparel ads, which used to be ubiquitous, but now um, they're a bit obsolete. So, for those of you who, who may not know this work, this was, a, sorry, may not know the original advertisement. Um, uh, American Apparel ads uh, were featured sort of all over. I remember them at the, at the back of Coast um, magazines and now magazines in Toronto, um, billboards, bus stops, things like this. And, and they typically featured um, a normatively beautiful cisgendered woman, um, thin and, you know, possessing all of the, the markers of normative beauty. Um, sort of dressed in American apparel, um, apparel um, like Jess is, and um, and they were positioned oftentimes to be sort of um, docile and 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 highly desirable. So Jess um, inserted themselves into this sort of conventional at the time trope or or aesthetic, and Jess is not who you might typically meet in these. Um, advertisements. Jess is a white, gender queer, um, noticeably disabled person. And um, these photographs were featured in the Contact Festival in Toronto, which places photography in, in, in public, um, publicly facing venues such as billboards, bus shelters, street facing vitrines of galleries, and things like that. And one of the places that this work was featured was um, on the LCD screens of um, the TTCs, the, um, the, the subway stations in Toronto. So, and these were, these are spots that usually would feature um, American apparel ads. And so I, I think about the subversion within this work, and I like to sort of imagine someone on their way to work um, on, the, on the subway and sort of at 8.30 in the morning, bleary eyed, um, sort of looking at sort of this image of what they might think of as an American apparel ad catches their eye and they look up towards it. And instead of seeing the kind of body they might typically see and might typically um, have their desire satiated or, or feel the desire for this body. Instead, they see this um, sort of unapologetically different kind of body stare, staring back at them. And of course, we never know sort of how our art impacts others, but I, I imagine that perhaps this work and in this exchange, um, the, the viewer was invited not to sort of look away with confusion or even disgust, but allow themselves to, to, to have their expected desire fulfilled um, by, by this different kind of body. And in this way, I think this is a great example of how disability art um, interrupts how disability is normatively understood as 
undesirable, asexual, um, and not deserving of a, a, a place in public culture. Um, and these are all things that we can argue are important, the living a fulfilled life as a disabled person, the right to um, see oneself represented in culture, the right, the right to um, be taken up as someone who's valuable and desirable in all kinds of ways, who can get dates and make family and, and all of these things. And these are things that are impossible to legislate. We can't um, include in the, the law that we must all, um, you know, desire disability. And of course, we wouldn't want to legislate desire because that could go down a, uh, the wrong direction. But still, it's undeniable that these are things that, that we all, that, you know, lots of us, lots of us want. Um, so in this way, I think art has a capacity to, to forward these kinds of understandings in a way that policy, legislation, even writing newspaper articles and academic journal articles cannot. So we'll go to the next slide, please. So this next slide is an image from um, deaf artist Christine Sang Kim and it's part of our Sound of Silence series. And Christine is a multidisciplinary um, deaf artist. And she, she talks a lot about her relationship with sound and, and noise and, and herself making noise. And she says that as a deaf person, she's often assumed not to have any sort of relationship with noise. But on the other hand, um, as a child, she was always sort of scolded for making too much noise, walking too heavily, and even making sounds with her, her mouth and, and things like the sounds that she, she couldn't hear, but she was responsible for controlling. Um, so this work, she, she wanted to think about the creative potentiality of, of noise as a deaf person, and to think about the different, um, different possibilities for, for engaging with sound other than through, through one's auditory senses. So she created these devices. So you see her kneeling over and de deconstructed speakers that are connected to amps. And she's hooked up a microphone. You can see her holding this microphone. Um, and she's creating noise uh, through an input into the amp through her breath and, and making sounds, which causes the amps to, to move and to vibrate with the motion of, of the sound waves that she's creating. And on some of the amps, she, she places um, blank canvases on top of them. And on top of that, she'll put pools of paint or, or a pencil or a stick of graphite and then by causing the amps to, to vibrate with her noise, it causes the writing, the writing utensil to, to move around and to, to create art in that kind of way. So this work isn't necessarily about the, the visual artwork that it creates. It's a performance and it's meant to um, have people think about the different kinds of ways that being embodies differently. Um, can generate different kinds of creative practices. Um, to, and I think this is a great example of sort of the innovativeness that comes out of um, be, being in, in a body differently and how we can think about that as, as creating artwork. So the next slide. Um, so Christine Sun Kim is a prolific artist. Um, she's now featured sort of all over the place, including she. She makes these um, beautiful billboards that appear throughout the states. Um, leading up to the 2020 um, American election last November, she created lots of signs using finger spelling that spelled out vote to encourage people to vote. Um, she's created a, a huge LCD um, animation in times, featured in Times Square that thanks the, the frontline workers in ASL. Um, and that was in response, of course, to COVID. Um, 
And this work is called The Sound of Tem Temperature Rising. And then on the billboard, it says nonstop, and that's crossed out, and it says forever. So um, obviously, she's you know, making work of more than just her deaf experience. Um, she's quite socially engaged. The so next slide. So this is an artist named Carmen Capella who identifies as a non-visual learner um, and also he, he's blind. Um, and he works out of uh, Vancouver. So Carmen Papella, um, as a blind person, navigates a world with a white indicator stick that you might typically see blind people using. Um, and he recognizes that, that that ensures his safety getting around the world. But he's also not comfortable with what the stick represents. It's tied to um, the Canadian National Institute for the Blind, with, which has investments in rehabilitating people, but also in a more ideological um, perspective, he, he, he takes issue with the fact that the white cane is designed to um, allow him to navigate a world that wasn't built for him in mind. It also indicates to other people that he is someone who needs help. So he, he talks about how, you know, the white cane makes him a spectacle in which people come up to him and unhelpfully move him in different directions that he wants to go. So he takes up his art practice. One of the things he takes up in his art practice is thinking about different ways sort of fantastical ways that he could navigate the world um, in ways that sort of respond to how he, he sensorially navigates the world. So as part of a residency in Portland, Oregon, uh, Carmen decided, wouldn't it be fantastic if I could navigate the world without my white stick um, with using um, uh, my, my hearing auditory senses instead? So we hooked up with the high school marching band you see on the slide, and together they worked out a score which would safely help them navigate the city. So they worked out visual cues for things like turn right, turn left, stop, um, and also if you have a clear path, you know, feel free to walk speedily, things like that. Um, and so this work is called Mobility Device. And if we had more time, I would screen um, the, the video, but it's copied there in, on the YouTube uh, link. But you can also just type in Carmen Papella into YouTube and Mobility Device into YouTube and, and you'll find it right away. And it's a really joyful um, performance. And he said, you know, after when, when he's reflecting, that, uh, you know, he's always a spectacle as a blind person on the street. And this day was no different. He was still a spectacle, but for, for reasons that he, he was in control of and, and determined. And, and he spoke about how, you know, quickly he could walk around um, and sort of the, the sense of joy and also the security that came from this performance. So I think this is, again, a really beautiful example of how artists can, can use their practice to intervene in access issues, for example, and put forth these sort of ridiculous notions for what a mobility device could look like and what a world would look like that, that helps that mobility device. Um, and it, but at the same time, then it is sort of fantastical and ridiculous. It also sort of moves draws our attention to how the world isn't built for disabled people in mind and how wonderfully creative we can engage in the project of free worlding to think about how we might transform public space in ways that that anticipated welcomed and and desired different ways of, of being in the world so the next slide is um, a slide by, this is a sort of introducing work by Vanessa Diem Fletcher, who's an indigenous um, artist, Padawarmi and Lanape. Um, and Vanessa is also 
um, someone who has a, a learning disability. And of that learning disability, Vanessa describes that sometimes she feels like there's boxes in her head that don't open. And that makes it difficult for her to read and write, which I think is a beautiful description of a learning disability. So um, Vanessa is interested in, re in recuperating her native language, her Lenape language. And Lenape, historically, was a culture that was premised, it was an oral culture. So there was there was no reading and no writing in the Nape culture. It was it was all oral. And so you can think about, as Vanessa does, the irony of her having to navigate the world as an indigenous person with difficulty in learning in reading and writing. Um, and this and how her difficulties in her learning disability altogether might sort of fade away and be irrelevant if she, if she were allowed to live, able to live in her Lenape culture. Um, and so she's interested in recuperating this, the, her, her native language and her, her Lenape culture. So this was work performed at um, the Crippen New York Symposium, which Ioka was at a few years ago, uh, 2009, it was a big gathering which brought together disability artists, curators, arts council officers, and academics. And this work is called Binding Language, a word scavenger hunt. So Vanessa begins the performance lying on the stage, and there's some audio of her grandmother speaking to her in Lenape. And then she gets up and she, uh, she introduces um, a, um, a tool that she has to um, to, to recover her Lenape language. And this tool is an English Delaware dictionary. And Delaware is the colonial word for Lenape, so an English Lenape dictionary. So here she is as an indigenous learning disabled person trying to recuperate her oral culture. And the tool that she has um, that's most readily available to her is a colonial text. So you can see the layers of barrier. She has to negotiate the written word, which is not accessible to her, as well as, as a colonial pr product in order to recuperate her oral indigenous language. So she said that, so, so, so the performance is about her um, setting out to find different written words in, in, the simple, in the room that we're gathered in and to translate those words into Lenape using this dictionary. So you can go to the next slide, please. So one of the, um, so in the slide you can see that she encounters somebody who has a tote bag and on the tote bag are different spellings of the word woman. So she has a cell phone in her hand and the cell phone is, for, is connected to the, the overhead projector. So whatever she shines her cell phone on, it's then projected on, onto the big screen. And she, she, so she's looking at this bag and considering these words woman. And, um, and so she looks up the word woman in, in her Delaware um, dictionary. And then she finds the word um, woman. She also reads the related terms around that. You know how uh, when you look things up in the dictionary, there are, are related terms around that word. And in this case, the related word phrases and words were things like woman, fat woman, childless woman, um, a phrase would be a bad woman, um, things like this. So as she's reading this, a white woman, as she's reading these related terms, she, she arises the fact that not only did she have to navigate colonialism and colonial violence to access her oral language, she also has to um, engage with sort of horrendous sexism in, in the way that the word um, woman is, is phrased. Uh, 
So Patricia so made this was a really powerful example of participability. Arts can engage sort of the multi-layers of colonialism, sexism, and ableism by, by surfacing um, the ease at which we can access the English language through, through these colonial tools and the difficulty, the barriers that we have in accessing um, or that Vanessa has in accessing her, her native oral culture. So the next slide is sort of a bridging slide. And this slide um, takes us to um, thinking about the relationship between disability arts and what I spoke about earlier, it's cultural practices. So this is work by um, a disabled mad artist, Prisim and Blackbridge. She's quite prolific, I, I probably some of you know her. Um, and she's been identifying as a disabled artist since the 1970s. Uh, and she lives and works in Hornby Island in British Columbia. And this was, this is work called um, Constructed Identities. And we were lucky enough to have this work as our, our inaugural show at the Tangled Art Gallery in 2014, um, right when it opened. So we sort of, we set the bar high, high, so to speak. And this work, I think, really demonstrates what we can think of as group aesthetics. And by that, I mean the, the aesthetics in this work. And, you know, I'm speaking from my perspective, but what I find satiating and sensorially pleasing about this work is how these, these bodies, these, these figures are asymmetrical, um, lopsided. They're made up of human-made um, objects like old hearing aid batteries and things like that, and wood and bird wings and sticks and jaw bones, things like this. And lots of them are held together by, again, sort of artificial parts, steel rods and things like this. And all of this contributes to in my opinion, their, their beauty. It doesn't distract from it. It helps us understand the way that disability and, and embodied difference in general can, can lead to sort of beauty and satiation and aesthetics rather than distract from it. And I remember that when I was, I was working in the gallery, someone came in and after they had a look around, the gallery, they said, you know, this work is incredible. It's the first time that I ever saw myself reflected in the artwork um, in a gallery. And I thought that was such a poignant um, comment. And, you know, when I reflected on it, I, I sort of related to what the person was saying myself, um, which I think, you know, is not a literal comment. Uh, you know, this, this person didn't have opening for an arm or anything like that, but but somehow they they related to sort of the the embodiments that that persimmon was creating. So next slide. So part of Tangle's commitment as a disability art gallery is that they work with artists to integrate accessibility um, from the very beginning of their, their artistic sort of practice. So, so in other words, we don't treat or Tangle does not treat um, accessibility as an add-on, something that sort of um, um, divorced from the artistic process or divorced from the aesthetics of the work. It's not a slap job. It's not a, a sort of add-on at the end of, the, of everything. So when, when Persimmon was, was making this work, we approached her and said, um, we, we will have audio description describing your work to, to the audiences, to, to, to blind audiences. But that's useful, but it also means that a blind person can't engage immediately with the artwork. They have to have the, the artwork translated to them through the third party interpreter. So we'd like to, to incorporate another more immediate way to interact with the artwork. So is it okay, we asked Persimmon, if people 
touch your your artwork so they can have the tactile experience of it and she said no you know that the artwork is too delicate and it will break um which is a perfectly valid response to, to give right that these are her, her works um so we sort of had a little brainstorm in the gallery and we go back to her with some different options for how we might make the work accessible and you know these options included things like we could have a 3d printout of an image of her work in, in silicone and so it could be a silicone replica that people could handle in in the gallery space and Persephone responded by saying, you know what, how about I challenge myself to make one piece of work that's tactile. So the image that you see on the right that's sort of um, affixed to, to uh, a, a wooden backing is that one sculpture that she made with the intentions of being touched. And Persephone um, commented on how making this work really expanded her own artistic practice. It was a creative challenge. So rather than sort of standing back from the work and looking at it visually to assess, you know, if it was balanced or finished or needed needed more work, uh, she assessed the readiness, and the 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 um, the aesthetics of the work through through touch herself, um, as sort of the primary way to experience this, this work, the intended way to experience the work. Um, and Brzezman talked about how, how this um, expanded her, her creative practice. And also it, um, it produced more artwork for the show. So our demand for art, for access, um, led, led to the creation of more art, which is, is, always, is always, you know, a nice outcome. So next slide, please. So, so that the, the artwork um, with person and the tactile work was an example of a crib cultural practice. And I'll introduce that more formally in a minute, but it was a creative way to respond to the access needs of disabled people in a way that anticipated that disabled people would come in and um, wanted to think about creating an equivalent experience rather than just sort of you know here's a headset and you know go away sort of thing so dear dear relo who's actually another alumna from nascat i think she was there in the, in the late 90s um she's she's a, a feminist artist in toronto and um she won an award through the images festival um uh, sort of a lifetime achievement award and as a result she showed her work in in different galleries in uh the 401 building in toronto some of you may know it it's a it's a building with lots of artist run centers and things like that including tangled so so tangled was one of the exhibiting um the exhibiting venues so again, they engage Deirdre in this kind of conversation about how to make the work accessible. And her videos are, are very sort of minor, I would say, and um, process-based. So they include things like her um, doing leg um, curls with a cat post or her um, dog, like undoing and doing up dog girl. Um, strips or or scratching in the screen door um and so these kinds of things are very sort of sensorially impactful if you can see any and hear them but but the experience of witnessing somebody dribbling a basketball at a very low range as, as one one of her videos did can't can't um adequately be translated or described through captions that would read you know that 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 or something like that so in response to our, our and the videos were captioned they also had audio description but in in addition to these more traditional approaches to access did we work with actually another alumna and that's 
David Bobier, who's a deaf artist in London, working in London, Ontario. And he has um, what, what is called the Vibrofusion Lab. And similar to what was described as Christine San Kim, he creates um, vibrotactile extensions that translate the um, auditory, the score of a film into, it amplifies the sound waves of auditory scores to create um, these vibrating extensions or sculptures. So you can see here on the screen um, that students are um, kneeling on a, a stage which is vibrating with the score of the video. So in, in one of the videos, um, Deirdre is uh, chewing on a balloon. It's a very tight shot. We see only part of her face and then an inflated balloon. Um, and she's chewing on that balloon until it pops in her face. And again, you can imagine sort of the, the visceral effective response you might have to, to watching this video. Uh, your, your anxiety rises knowing that, that this balloon's gonna pop in her face. Um, so, so to sort of translate that into another sensorial experience, she and David created a pillow, which was, I think was more of a, a prototype than anything else, but it was meant to be sort of replicate a balloon that you could hold near your chest or in your lap and it would vibrate and the vibrations would increase as the tensions increased and eventually this this pillow would sort of erupt in your in, in on your body causing the same sort of emotional response so this brings us to the final section and this is sort of a shorter section i'm keeping my eye on the time um, but if you could click for well, that would be great. Uh, and maybe back one, actually. So the next one, so, so, so group cultural practices, as, as I've said, um, are, are, are ways of approaching access that center the innovativeness of disabled people. And also the group politic, um, which is a desire for disruption. So in so many ways, and maybe we can talk about this in, in the, the discussion, um, you know, we can think about arts and culture as being inhospitable to lots of kinds of people. And I think, you know, last year during the pandemic, there was lots of discussion about how galleries are racist and colonial and um, anti-Black racist for, in particular, and sort of exclude people in, in all kinds of ways and how a cultural recovery needs to attend to the exclusions and not necessarily um, return to normal or build back better, but actually use this, this cultural break that the pandemic has initiated as an opportunity to think about how, how galleries and cultural spaces could, could shape themselves differently and be welcome to different kinds of people. So crypt cultural practices does this. And, and this is a, this, the quote on the slide is by Catherine Breezy again. And she says, disabled people don't seek merely to particip participate in Canadian culture. We want to create it, shape it, and stretch it beyond its tiny edges. And another way of thinking about this, or another reason for thinking about this is, it's to acknowledge that, that there are infinite numbers of ways to be embodied. We, there are a multitude of embodiments and access needs as a result. And there are also infinite ways to make artwork and, and different kinds of artwork. So to standardize this approach, to think that, to even think that there could be a standard way of approaching making art accessible, sort of denies these infinite possibilities for how bodies and art can interact. And because we're artists, because you're artists, because curators are creative people as well, disability art thinks about this sort of, this potentiality as a creative opportunity 
to 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 transform the way that we make art as we as we um, have, have seen in, in the aforementioned examples. So I'm just and maybe click forward, Well, thank you. So just to um, give two or three examples and, and then we'll turn into discussion. So I, I think if we had a longer time, maybe in the discussion, I would introduce different ways of, of conceptualizing access. And I think, you know, when we're resisting treating, not, treating access as a, a logistic concern, something that we do to, to comply to a minimum legal standard for the duty to accommodate, the, then we approach access through it as a series of check boxes. You know, does the door have a does it, does the door have a an access button? Does the, the do the stairs have an accompanying ramp? Those sorts of things. Um, but um, we also have this description of um, a critical access framework, which is um, a framework for thinking about how access is, is political work. Um, that's introduced by a scholar named Amy Hamry. So, so, so they sort of encourage us to recuperate access from its bureaucratic holdings and think about how access could, could actually work towards one size fits one solution. So, so how access can be determined and shaped and influenced by the experience of disabled people, rather than be, being motivated through by this neoliberal idea that good access makes things better for everyone. Because when we approach access in, in those kinds of ways, we miss people, right? So if we only hire ASL interpretation because somebody's requested it, then we, then we miss the opportunity to foreground accessibility to make our, our, our events accessible um, through, again, a desire that deaf people will show up. Um, so, so access becomes logistic, it becomes sort of a chore rather than an opportunity to be invitational and to center disabled people, as um, Amy, Amy Hamry encourages us to do. So, and I wanted to give an example about how this approach to access, critical access can, can inform the kinds of art that we make. So on the screen is um, a piece called, um, from a piece by Shannon Finnegan from her series Museum Benches. And Shannon is someone who, who needs to sit down a lot when she's at, at the gallery. Um, and so when she's invited to produce work, to, when she's commissioned to produce work for galleries, what she does is she can, she produces these, these benches, like the one on the screen that reads, um, this exhibition has asked me to stand for too long, sit if you agree. And in an interview between Hamley and Pittingen for American Art in 2019, um, they talked about these bunches and as inviting um, particip participation as an embodied argument um, to make a political statement. So these bunches are quite different than sort of these discrete little foldable stools that you might get at a gallery or a museum and have to sort of haul around with you and open and close. Um, and these kinds of ineffective ways of administering access I would argue aren't dedicated to making the gallery accessible. Instead, they're dedicated to meeting the minimum requires, requirements that they're legally obligated to do while leaving sort of the, the ableist structure of the, the gallery intact. So access is dismissible, it's, it's, um, it's um, inconspicuous um, and how different it is to have these sort of bold statements that this bench is, is in resistance to, to an able-bodied expectation that the gallery, the gallery projects. And here's, here's an intervention, and, and we invite you to participate in it as well. So next slide, please. <clears throat> 
So the next sort of access way of thinking about access that I wanted to introduce. Um, how am I going to start this? No, sorry, I started in, in a different way. So, okay, so I'm sorry, I'm just a bit mixed up. So, so the next access framework that I wanted to take up is this idea of a sensibility, which comes from Elwood Jimmy, who's a free artist working at Guelph, Ontario. And when asked to participate in a roundtable discussion on what, what accessibility is, um, Jimmy sort of came up with this framework of accessibility. And he says accessibility, um, um, so sorry, um, sorry, I mixed up, but now I'm back on track. So um, he, he began this sort of thinking about accessibility um, by taking interest in how we very seldom question what accessibility gives us access to. And as someone who is Indigenous, Cree, and disabled, he, he makes an observation about how um, cultural institutions commit to access in a similar way that they commit to decoloniality. And he uses this, this metaphor of a land acknowledgement, how you know, every gallery under the sun in, you know, this north part of Tur Turtle Island begins their event with, with a sort of standard or maybe maybe attenuated land acknowledgement. But then that's that. Then, then we move on and carry on with our colonial ways of administering and experiencing culture and hoarding indigenous artifacts and all of these things. So what's at the statement? But it's not a commitment to do things differently in the in in the cultural space. So he, he, he suggests similarly that that's how cultural institutions take up access. They they sort of commit to it on a surface level, but they don't think about sort of dismantling the the ableism and the inaccessibility that holds these institutions together, similar to how we're sort of resistant to dismantling the colonialism that that sent, that provides the core of, of these cultural institutions in which we all live and work. I mean, NASCAD, um, my university, X university formerly, Ryerson University, Tangled Art, like these are all colonial spaces. Um, so Alvin and, and sort of, suggests that because access is um, is directed towards finding our way into these spaces, access can either confirm these spaces and say, yeah, these are great spaces, we want to be in them, so let's find ways to, to allow disabled people to be in, in these spaces. And in so doing, we give access to participating in the same kind of cultural violence um, that, that these spaces have, have always been participating in. Or access can be an opportunity to sort of change the way that these spaces operate um, by, by using the tools that, that, that we have available to us in these cultural spaces. This is, this is pretty abstract, so I wanted to give two examples and then and then I have some questions for you about how access can work to disrupt um, to both disability justice as well as decolonial ends. So this is a work on the screen. This is an image um, of uh, um, a, a piece called An Altar to Our Ancestors by Keisha Williams. And it was part of an exhibition called Hidden, that was curated by Gloria Swan um, for the Tangled Art Gallery. And Gloria Swan identifies as a, as a mad black aging artist. And, um, and that, that's what Hidden was all about. It was then covering the racism, the systemic ableism that, that sort of keeps people with hidden disabilities out of these cultural spaces. And one of the participating artists was ultimately unable to produce for it to exhibit. So rather than just sort of dismiss the artist or, you know, 
can you know and and um, disinvite the artists from from the show. Um, Gloria helped space for this artist. So if you click forward to um, the next slide, please. This um, yeah, this is an image of, of this work called Holding Space. And it was accompanied by an empty plinth. And the text that I know you can't read explained um, that the empty plinth serves the dual purpose of welcoming spirits of disabled artists into the gallery, um, spirits that have passed on due to injustices, and also to remind us to make space for living disabled artists who could not be present due to their disability. So the artist statement, which is on, on the screen, the, the final sentence reads, holding space is about allowing someone to, to take all the time they need to, to heal. It's about assuring them that they are loved, valued, valued and irreplaceable. So this artist was paid an artist fee. They were included in the, the um, exhibition catalog. And, and in this kind of way, you know, they, um, Gloria so it sort of spoke about um, including this artist in, a, in this kind of disruptive way um, that sort of committed to um, processing the way that so many artists are excluded from galleries. So rather than having this be a, a quiet story that people just sort of don't even notice, she amplified the systemic reasons um, for that this artist could not participate and also sort of use some of the colonial tools of the, of the gallery, things like artist fees and, and things like that in subversive ways to pay the artist even though she was not participating. So in this way, I think it's a great example of what uh, Jimmy is, is telling us is that we might think about you, um, using access as an opportunity to encourage cultural institutions to, to break from their co colonial habits of being, to not just commit to access and decoloniality and saying, but also in doing and, and being to transform the practices which, which are held in these spaces. So the next slide and the final example um, is um, still from um, Ojibwe artist Yolanda Bowen, who, who produced a, a play called Back um, that, was, that is about sort of her experience with intergenerational trauma. Um, and how, how sort of colonial violence um, impacts one to write, one's chances for survival in ongoing colonization. And so she, as she mounted this play at the Theatre Centre in Toronto, she took up what we might consider to be a decolonized um, approach to relaxed performances. So relaxed performances are is an example of a group cultural practice in which we relax the theater space. People can arrive early and leave late. They can make noise. They can sort of do all the, the things that they need to do to be comfortable in their body. Um, and Bolin Bonnell sort of took this this group cultural practice up to center. Um, indigenous people in this in this theater space. So she opened the the, the play um, with you know an extended land acknowledgement, which sort of extended into the the play itself. And she also invited people to relax the space, and she called upon elders to identify themselves um, in the space and to come up on onto the stage with her. And at the end of the performance, she, when there was a talk back, um, she made it clear that she only wanted questions from Indigenous women and two-spirited people. And there were medicine, traditional medicine um, people on site and things like this. So in this way, she again sort of thought about how we might use, as it says on the screen, insensibility to interrupt the satisfaction with, with, we have with 
the securities and the rewards we, we receive in the dominant system and allow us to again challenge colonial ways of being. So, uh, so accessibility can disrupt, and I would argue should disrupt. And this is a really, I think, interesting example about how accessibility, this practice of relaxing the theater space, can disrupt to make the space um, hospitable to to indigenous people, to, to operate with a different kind of center. The center of this play and how it was performed in the space was not a dedication to colonialism. It was a real dedication to, to decoloniality and you know, in, indigeneity in a way that shifted the space, shifted who we understood as who could speak and, and all of these things, who was prioritized in this space. So I think I'll leave it there um, because I, I would love to have a discussion. Um, but I know that it's a bit, it's, I, I, I always find it challenging when somebody talks for so long and then they're like, okay, let's have a discussion. So I, I prepared some questions that I thought we might engage. So if you can flip to, oh, sorry. If you could just um, share the, the screen again and um, go to the next slide. Okay, so this is the final quote from Jimmy who says, unless we are prepared to be differently rather than just to know or do things differently, colonial habits of being will remain unchallenged. And I think that's a, that's a call that we can take seriously in intersectional ways, anti-racist ways of being will remain unchallenged. When we, when we use access to, to integrate ourselves into normative culture, we are complicit in letting colonial, ableist, sexist habits of being um, remain unchallenged. So if you could click on the next slide, actually maybe, maybe two slides, so yeah. So these are just some questions you can either sort of speak to them or not. Um, but as I was talking to Jane about this invitation to NASCAR, I was so in, I was so excited to come because typically I talk to you know disability studies students who have their you know are engaged in this stuff in a really interesting way, but um, they're not artists necessarily. So I wondered about here's a question. So the first is, what are some of the tensions um, that exist within culture? How does culture exclude and, and include? And how could a critical access approach sort of address some of these tensions? And one of the tensions that you might be experiencing is a lack of representation of your community, your identity um, within artists, artworks, curators, boards of directors, um, anything at all. Um, and how might critical access sort of um, intervene and disrupt um, these exclusions? Also, what group cultural practices are you using in your work? Um, and thinking about how access, thinking about access is facilitating interaction between people and art how might you make your work more accessible by um, using group cultural practices or even innovating new ones? How are you doing that already? And I'd be happy to sort of collectively brainstorm if, if you have a, a sort of tension that you that needs to be addressed. And yeah, maybe I'll just leave it with those two. But okay, that's it. So very happy to have a conversation at this point. Thank you so much, Eliza. That was really interesting. And I um, I know I, I have a lot of questions, but I don't want to um, take away the opportunity for anybody who's here participating to have a chance to um, ask you or comment on uh, the things that you've presented. Um, and you can type your comments in the chat and I will we already have 
by the way, Eliza, you may remember this from being a student at NASCAD. Studio classes start at one in the afternoon. And so when we have the noon hour talk, sometimes people have to leave. Um, so we already have a thank you from Kimmer. I'm not sure who Kimmer is. Uh, thank you for the presentation, very eye-opening. Um, so that's our first comment um, to you, but maybe just to warm things up, could I ask you to um, elaborate a little bit on something that you said, which um, was when you were talking about uh, providing access like to everyone, and I, I assume you meant kind of universe, you talked about it as a neoliberal concept, and I, I think, were you talking about like the, the notion of universal design, which um, makes, the, the goal is to make everything accessible to everyone, but it was your point that this then makes disabled people invisible or, or um, negligible? Maybe, I wasn't quite sure I understood you there. So I'd love to hear you go back to that point. Yeah, thank you. That's a, that's a good point to, to go back to. I sort of went through that really quickly. So, I mean, it can be sort of difficult. And I know, Jane, you, you and others are engaged in these, these questions of access around NASCAD and, you know, what, what that looks like. And I think this, this notion of, so when, you know, <laughs> I hate to go back this far, but during the time when so many disabled people were institutionalized, the, the world was sort of built up without us in mind. We weren't on the street, we weren't in, in city, city building planning meetings. So when deinstitutionalization happened in the 70s and 80s, we sort of were let back into a culture that was inaccessible. So it makes sense that access was sort of the first thing the disability activists tried to address. And at that point, it was a radical suggestion that things be totally transformed to become accessible. And because of that activism by dis disabled people, we now have uh, um, access legislation, probably not enough, probably too slow, but we're sort of incorporated into the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms and you know other kinds of legislation. Um, but to convince the, the private sector and the public sector to become accessible, to to put a ramp in their storefront right next to the stairs. The argument has been a neoliberal one, that if you make your store accessible, you'll have more customers, you, it's better for business. As well as sort of this neoliberal idea of this cost savings um, equation that, that we can only spend money when it benefits more more than one or sort of a subsection of people. So, so a ramp is too expensive when we think that it will only accommodate the disabled people who we've never seen before because why would they show up to an accessible store or university for that matter? So that becomes too expensive. But if we widen the user base of that ramp to include you know, delivery people with their dollies and parents with their strollers, then it becomes more sort of beneficial, like the, the cost benefit increases. And, and in that way, we can legitimate um, spending money on access. And that's sort of the impetus of this idea of universal design. If you make things accessible, it's better for everyone. And of course, that's absolutely true. But it also decenters, as you were saying, disabled people. It doesn't recognize disabled people as having wisdom um, and creativity to sort of think about how to address access issues. It, it moves it into a logistic response. And the other thing that it does is it sort of, like there are all kinds of ways that we need to make things accessible that don't benefit everyone, right? Ramps, Fine, that's quite easy. But if we think of, you know, integrating tactile artwork into a gallery, um, that that doesn't necessarily benefit everyone, or even captions on videos. I hear the argument all the time that 
captions of videos distract from its aesthetic. I would do it, but I just hate the way it looks. Things like this. I don't have any deaf people in the, in the audience anyway. So, so when when we um, so it, those sorts of insertions sort of indicate to us that we only make things accessible when we think that they'll sort of broadly benefit the population. And 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 if that's our motivation, then what happens when we have to book an ASL interpreter? without knowing if a deaf person is going to come to the talk. That sort of one size fits all um, equation doesn't work to justify that kind of access, which, which needs, to, needs to be enacted. Does that sort of clarify that? Yes, yes. It's a tricky um, question because as you say, universal design is good for, it is a good thing in general, but um, I think I, your, your point is very well made that it, um, the motivations behind it are, I think, coming from, a, well, I should say from a neoliberal background that is, 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 is not necessarily one in the same with the goals of disabled people and, and visibility and acknowledgement of their life and their work and their existence and in, in public spaces. It, it, I, I would say that it also sort of closes down the conversation of how creative access could be, right? So yeah. like if you're thinking about m making your, your graduating zip and accessible, it's not simply about sort of coming up with the best way to to create access. So it could be that you, I mean, I would say that you you should have audio description. Like that's that's a standard that you should always have. And that's sort of in, you know, that that's a bureaucratic standard. Um, but but that's not all that you can have. You can also approach access in all of these creative ways. So it's it's not about only having sort of saying, you know. Um, audio description is too straightforward. Let's let's try to make all the work vibrate. That that might not work in this particular instance, and it might not work for everyone in, in any instance. So I think the other thing that new that um, sort of traditional approaches to access can do is to trick us into thinking it's sort of a problem so solution orientation. We need to address access. There's a standard way to address access, and then we can move on. But what we're saying is, like, this is a creative moment to think about how we can how we can think about the interaction between people and artwork in all kinds of ways. So it's not about finding the best way, as so much as as sort of creating sort of an, an expanded possibility. I would say. Thank you so much. Are there any, would anybody else like to ask a question or have a comment for Eliza? I see, oh, I'm not monitoring the question and answer. I was just looking in the chat. We have a question from Melissa. Um, hi there, thank you for your presentation. The examples you used helped me understand the information you shared. I smiled at the idea of walking down the street guided by an orchestra. So creative and fun. Your presentation helped me, helped me be more aware of my own blindfold when thinking about accessibility in various spaces and the often associated colonial violence. Yeah, that's excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Eliza from um, and Barbara and um, I, I, I did want to say I, I, uh, the ways that you connected the, access, the idea of access to what kinds of spaces was so, so relevant and so important because the access that we, the spaces that we get access to are, you know, Western determined spaces. But I, I have another uh, comment in the chat here from Heli. Uh, you touched on the artist who identifies as a non-visual learner. 
there are a lot of assumptions in education about how people take in knowledge, especially in the arts, and trying to narrow a focus onto a single type of instruction that works best for most. How to begin to include and expand institutional learning understanding to help those who learn and think in different ways, especially for long-standing institutions like NASCAP. A great question. Do you I'm I'm just thinking. I wonder. I, I think um, it's such a great question. And I think what you're, you're sort of highlighting in a really nice way is, is that we assume uh, that the people show up in our institutions um, will sort of be able to easily manage the way that our institutions are laid out, be able to figure out how to sign up for classes, to get to class, to participate in class, all of these things. And, and to, to work in this sort of hyper-productive way, although I had a really nice time on that, but, you know, in other educational experiences, it, you know, it's so hyper-productive. You have to produce, produce, produce to get an extension on an exam. You, you can't just tell your prof that you need more time. You have to get a doctor's don't You have to get sort of a medical authority to legitimate your access requirement, which is a whole other conversation to be having. Um, but I think these kind of, kind of um, tensions um, indicate that, you know, the way the institution is set up um, benefits the status quo, right? And I say that about my institution all the time. If people are expected to be able to easily um, get into the institution, perform, and and get out in in a normative way, um, and and anyone who doesn't sort of comply with that standard or or needs to do something different, it's always approached in, in an individual manner. So back to Carmen and his 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 predicament of mobility devices. If we can use that to for a metaphor the solutions that we offer people who don't quite fit into the institution are more akin to a white cane. You know, stay out of our way. Here's, here's something that might help you navigate this system that isn't built for you, but it, it allows us to leave the system intact. And what would happen if we use someone who was sort of a misfit, misfit with the institution as instead an opportunity to, to think about what, what is it about these long classes or, or expected late, late nights of work or high tuition or, or the fact that people have to separate from their families and their, their first nation reserves in order to participate in university education. What if we use these sort of moments of tension or conflict as an opportunity for productive disruption in ways that could reroute the university. I feel like I'm not quite making sense, but um, to put it simply, rather than treating sort of a disruptive presence as sort of an individual problem that we need to address on an individual level by giving someone a white cane, for example, what, what would happen if we, we um, approach that instance of disruption as an indication that, you know, maybe the, the institution as it's set up doesn't work for everyone. And rather than allow someone into the space, how can we, how can we shape, reshape this space in a way that sort of anticipates and welcomes different ways of being? And I would say that's sort of more akin to sort of the marching band approach of disrupting the space altogether. But it's a great question. I mean, we could we could think about examples of what that might mean. Maybe it would be, you know, sweat lodges and university quads or intergenerational dormitories and you could live in the dorm with your families so that you aren't having to sort of separate yourself from your 
cultural teaching. It could be getting university credit for um, having language classes with a knowledge keeper who wasn't paid by the university. All of these things would disrupt sort of the business of, of the university. But, but it may be those kinds of disruptions that, that we need in order to, to um, carry on and to welcome different kinds of people into the space. So I think it's always a good exercise to look around the classroom and think, you know, who is not here, right? Like, where are my disabled, deaf, indigenous, person, you know, person Asian students? And if they're not here, why are they not here? And how can we sort of um, work towards changing the space to, to, in a way that makes it more sort of welcoming um, to, to difference, I guess. Thank you so much, Eliza. Um, we have a couple more, I think, comments more than questions. Um, and this may be a kind of good way for us to wrap up um, because it's a big thank you to you. Uh, thanks a lot. This is from Meg Dorward, who is also on the um, Accessibility Committee. Um, so, yeah. Um, and she's also an MA student uh, at NASCAD right now. So Meg says, thanks, Eliza, very eye-opening. I love the piece, Holding Space, um, personally identifying as someone with an invisible disability. This piece was very hopeful and caring and sheds light on how I would bring ethics and care to my own curating practice. And to your last point, what you were just talking about, about making the space more accessible, she says, adds not to mention disrupting colonial modalities and reclaiming space for marginalized populations. So you've given us so much to think about today and um, I, I want to thank you very much. And uh, I would also like to thank um, and, and Barbara for helping make this uh, possible through the, uh, and, and the accessibility committee. And I would like to thank um, Will Robinson in multimedia for uh, as usual, your always fantastic, reliable support. And I would also like to thank Aoka Janaid for her um, amazing, incredible um, uh, ASL interpretation. And so I think that we will, unless there's anything else, um, thank you so much, Eliza. Thank you all. It was great to be here. Thanks, Jane, for all your organizing work and Will and Anne Barbara. It was great. Thank you. Talk soon sometime. Bye.